Hi, hey everybody! Friends. We're here for another What We Read video. Yes, we are. Uh, yeah, we read a lot of things. Quite a few things, and you're finally time. sort of coming out of my slump, right? Because yeah. I think for those of you who've seen, I've just been reading all of the digital digital comics, and I at wanted, least until last time. This is the last time, and, and then we had that TBR video, and that was just me kind of cleaning it all out a bit by bit. Plus a couple of others that some friends in publishing are like, mm. "Hey, would you you know take a look at this book, etc." But before we get into that, I just want to take a Marvel Unlimited minute and talk are you about. Gonna take literally a minute. Let's find out. Probably not. No, it's, and it's more than just that because I also uh, in, in the last uh, book haul bought like a bunch of digital comics, and I did read a couple of those. So I want to start with a couple you of shout. Call it comments on comics. Comments on comics. I like that. You know, it's like the I like alliteration. CC logo. I don't know how to do that. Uh, also, it looks like I'm, you know, kind of <laughs> whatever. Anyway, um, so just a shout out to finally reading the end of X-Men Gold and X-Men Blue. It was really super sad, X-Men Blue, because they had to sort of recap. If those of you who don't know, X-Men Blue focused on the time-displaced X-Men, Scott, Jean, mm -hmm. uh, Warren, Bobby, and Beast. <laughs> Scott, Jean, Warren, Bobby, and Hank. Uh, collectively known as Cyclops, Wonder, uh, from Wonder Girl, Cyclops, Marvel Girl, it's like, this isn't Angel, right. Iceman, and Beast. They're time displaced, they're the younger versions of themselves, plopped into the present, and terrible shenanigans ensue. Crazy things happen. You know, Bobby finally comes out and doesn't want to, like, hide that he's gay anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we finally discover that Hank has had a crush on Jean this entire time. I mean, who and they're trying to, and, and, you know, Hank goes down a dark path. In, in the in the original timeline experiments to try to take away his mutation turn him into an actual beast because okay. he felt beastly so that's ironic here dabbling into a little bit of magic turns him into some weird kind of hell beast so that's some strange little can't escape your future kind of deal um, Angel uh, also has some weird kind of physical transformation he isn't the Archangel but because of their space adventures now he has like cosmic wings and fire and that's a little kind of weird and strange Scott decides to not date Jean because he sees the future and how everything that goes to hell in a handbasket. Goes off to this with the star jammers for a while okay. in space. And then Jean decides to be her own badass. Okay. Uh, and decides to, you know, become the old mega level mutant that she's always meant to be without the Phoenix. And even managed to tell the Phoenix to take a hike. X-Men Blue focuses on everything that happened after all of that stuff. Okay. And their decision to finally go home. Mm. Which they built it up. They said goodbye to everybody. And then Magneto attacks. And spoilers they don't go home and i'm just like oh my god okay fine and then and then there's x-men gold which is which should have ended with ideally the greatest wedding of all time it was kitty and and and, and peter's uh wedding finally and that went to hell in a handbasket to make room for the other spin-off which was mr and mrs x which is i think i don't know if it's called that but it's actually gambit and rogue that get married instead like just i'm like what like, all right, fine, so spoilers there. And it sort of ends with, um, you know, Kitty and the others doing the best that they can to, you know, with the world and, and whatever, and this young mutant boy gets shot after mm. they calm him down and they don't know if he's going to live or not. And it ends there! Almost like as an open-ended kind of thing of we don't know if the mutant, like, uh, prejudice is going to go away, mm. but this is maybe can't stop trying and doesn't mm. maybe can't stop hoping, so that was fine. The last shout-out that I kind of want to do is for the Batman um, Dark Knight's mm. metal... Um, series by Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder has been uh, writing a lot of Batman since the rebirth and this feels to me and I think to Zack Snyder as well uh, a combination of everything that he's done for, for, for the Batman series. This is a huge uh, crossover event much like uh, Blackest Night was back mm. in its day and this is a story about so everybody knows the multiverse. Mm -hmm. There's like a parallel shadow multiverse <laughs> Okay. Who knew? It's almost like all of the 52 worlds have like a shadow. Okay. Which is huge and super ambitious. And in a lot of those shadow universes, uh, Batman loses his freaking mind. Or whoever it serves as Batman of that mm -hmm. world. And he ends up co-opting one of the actual Justice League's powers. So to get better at crime in one universe, he decides to take the Speed Force and kills Barry Allen. There's a girl named Bryce Wayne who decides to become Atlantean and, you know, kill Aquaman. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the Batman who laughs, where he becomes the, where Bruce becomes the Joker, basically. Okay. Uh, and so on and so forth. You know, somebody takes Ares' powers and now he's like the Wonder Woman counterpart. Some of them becomes Doomsday and that's the, and so there's all, there's a negative evil Batman for every member of the Justice League. And it's now the bad universe trying to eat the good universe. And mm -hmm. it's just this really long winded, I'm just like, so many, so much potential, but also so much <laughs> camp. I wasn't too happy with it. It like. I have not been as super happy and since like Blackest Night, which made Alexa jump up and clap. That's so, really 
So it's, and it's another great Elseworld. It didn't even have the same impact as Flashpoint for me because Flashpoint for me was so clean. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was also the jumping point to the new 52, but that's my other angst. So um, so for me, it didn't really hold a candle too much mm -hmm. uh, to obviously the Flashpoint and um, uh, Blackest Night. But uh, it's a great attempt. I mean, there were a lot of really insane cameos and a lot of great ways to play. I still think you can't beat the Flashpoint universe where Thomas Wayne becomes Batman and Martha Wayne becomes the Joker when Bruce is killed in that alternate universe in Flashpoint world. So nothing has come close to me for that. So to have the Batman that becomes the Joker, sure, why not? And he's the their ringleader, basically. So that's the end of that a little comics round. Um, leave your comments in the comments. The first thing I'm going to talk about is a full book series. So one of my resol what part one of one of my resolutions. I finally read the entirety of the Winners Trilogy by Marie Rutkowski, which is an older YA fantasy series. Not that much older, but a little bit. So there's The Winner's Curse, The Winner's Crime, and The Winner's Kiss. And the first book, the first time I ever read it, I was kind of like, hmm, it's all right. That one basically starts off with Kestrel, the main character, who is the daughter of a Valorian general who is very good at strategy and is being convinced by her father to either join the military or get married, uh, which is a requirement for girls of her stature and of her upcoming age, uh, she ends up buying Arin from a sort of slave auction at the market and she incorporates him into her household slaves, only things are not quite as they seem. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it. So if I'm going to talk about the first book, I'm going to tell you guys that at the beginning, it's a lot of setup and it's a lot of character driven setup because it really allows readers to get to know Kestrel very well, which is obviously a good thing because Kestrel is such an interesting person, especially as you watch her do all the things she does until the end of the series. But honestly, for me, it just felt a little bit slow, like nothing really happens for a while. And then the big thing happens and then all of a sudden everything is just like falling into place all at once. And I liked it okay, and like it, I still felt pretty similar to the way I, I did when I read it the first time, which was like, it was fine, it was good. And then I reread the second book, which is The Winner's Crime, which is actually the book that convinced me I really liked the series, because in the second book, now that all the pieces are on the board and in play, you're sort of seeing how everything is like shifting, and there's a lot more court intrigue and politics in that one, there's spying in that one, there's like lots of hidden things, and like just watching Aaron and Kestrel manipulate and maneuver around these situations that they continue to face and the obstacles that they have to continue fighting against is so fascinating and I still think it's so well done and the way that the second book ends is just like heartbreaking still even though I knew it was coming I was just like I can't and then I finally read The Winner's Kiss, which is the third book, because Hannah, this, the entire reason that I actually read the series is because Hannah from So Obsessed With picked it as my friend pick of the month for April. Okay, so the third book basically wraps up this entire story and this is the book where things really come to a head. War is full full on happening in this one. Uh, a lot of betrayals are happening in this one. There is a lot of PTSD for both our main characters because they have been through so much and they have to learn to accept their new circumstances as they are and as they stand. And here's the thing, I was a little bit hesitant going into this one because it's gotten a lot of like mixed reviews. Like people generally liked it, but most people were like sort of in the middle on it not so much like loved it loved it and i was a little concerned because i had already felt that way about the first book but i actually ended up really enjoying the last book i think it was the direction that it was meant to go in after you know the build-up of the first and the second and i think it also helped that i read them like straight so i read the first and then the second and the third like consecutively and that really worked for me i also just loved seeing these two characters sort of like how far they've come from where they were in the first book to where they are in the last book. And I didn't actually know how it was going to end or how I even wanted it to end, but it actually felt like it made sense that it ended the way that it did. Again, spoiler territory, so I can't exactly say what that is, but I genuinely think that this is like a fantasy series that is a little different from what I would normally read in YA fantasy, especially these days when there's a lot of oversaturation of it, and I like that a lot about it. So I am glad that I finally, finally got to this one. Awesome. Thank you for being my book holder. <laughs> Always. Next week is a book that we got from uh, our friend Rachel uh, who got it at Comic Con. It's called The Revenge of Magic by James Riley. Pretty nifty lore at the, at the you know, at, in terms of a premise wise, where uh, at a certain like event cataclysmic date, a bunch of kids have the capacity to sort of manipulate uh, the forces of nature through, the, you know, as instructed by certain books of magic that different 
um, parts of the globe unearthed. And then, you know, they recruit these kids. There's like a secret school. And the, and the main character is a boy named Fort who uh, was roughly born around the time and would be a marginal candidate for this kind of magic stuff. But uh, after a terrible, terrible event when he's out with mm-hmm. his dad, uh, you know, unleashes dragons on the earth and his dad gets oh, sucked casually. through and there's a terrible, you know, kind of thing. Um, he wakes up, uh, you know, he wakes up from that, obviously orphaned because his mom had also passed. And, uh, you know, he's living with his aunt for a while. And then the knock on the door and saying, hey, you're going to magic school. Um, it goes pretty much downhill from there for me personally because it, it, it didn't quite land well mm-hmm. with me. I guess the storytelling style um, wasn't my, my kind of thing. More importantly, um, in an attempt to be kind of cool and edgy, some of the font in the book changes when it's like, you know, mental projections and living in people's memories, which I appreciate that trope. Like, I do appreciate that, that you kind of change, but the font became a little bit unreadable for me. Maybe because I'm just old and I have astigmatism, I don't know, and plus I read on the train a lot. So, <laughs> did it not uh, obviously help. Um, not one of my favorites, I'd like to say. Although the lore sounds pretty cool. Different types of books of magic. Like there's a book about healing. There's a book about destructive magic. There's a book about seeing into the future. There's a book about tele- 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 telepathy. Okay. Um, and how, you know, the governments around the world have sort of like shut that down. People started going insane doing the future magic. So great concept. Execution-wise, I wasn't, like it just wasn't my cup of tea. There you go. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. It just didn't work for me. But it's it, it's got its, it's got its, it's got its uh, you know, good points. And I kind of want to know what happens next but if i don't find out it's not gonna like destroy my world either like it's it's not like super like I, i'll google it you know what i mean so yeah that's uh, i really wanted to like this book but you know i only liked it, it to yay much the next book that i am going to talk about is actually one that i got as an egali from gallery books it is the key to happily ever after which is by tiff marcello i was especially excited to read this because i actually got the chance to meet tiff while i was oh, at cool. polycon okay. in march and she is so wonderful you should also read her other book that was only released ever as an ebook called north to you can't wait to read the rest of that series anyway the key to happily ever after actually centers around three sisters it's about marisol J- jane lynn i want to say and um, Pearl and it mostly focuses on Marisol and Pearl though and they have inherited their parents very successful wedding planning business in DC and so it's time for the three girls to step up and sort of you know make their mark on do the business thing. and do their thing only it turns out that's not as easy as they thought because they all have very different ideas of where things should go and it ends up resulting in a conflict that could possibly tear apart the business and their personal relationships with one another Eey, dot, dot, that's dot. not cool it was really delightful just reading the story a lot of it is because the sister dynamics and it reminds me a lot of my own dynamics with my sisters except that we would be in different roles in this story i would be jane lynn let's be real i think mel would probably be more like marisol and no actually no mel would be more like pearl and rachel would be more like marisol and now i know this book even better that will only make sense to like anyone who actually knows me and my sisters but really what i was trying to say was i could see a lot of different aspects of each of our personalities reflected in these three sisters and i also just felt like she did it in a way that felt realistic and that was really nice the thing however is that i went into this one expecting more like of a romance which i don't know why i did because it doesn't even say that in the summary at all there is a romantic aspect to it however and i do feel like there could have been more page time dedicated to it for all of the different romantic relationships that go on in that story because there are a few but overall it was just very charming it was fun to read about this family and these sisters and their struggle to like sort of it's it's their struggle with their own self-growth but also in, in their growth in their relationships with each other especially now as not just sisters but business partners so that part was fascinating also all the little like wedding planning detail aspects were so much fun to read i just love event planning and like reading about it and watching people do it on like reality shows my favorite thing so enjoy it so that was really fun there were also a lot of filipino cultural touches because the sisters are filipino uh, their family's filipino uh their parents are actually retired in the philippines in this book which is hilarious <laughs> to me oh, um but yeah they mentioned quite like... a few things like they mentioned filipino food and like a couple of cultural ticks that you know really only apply to filipino families and filipino family dynamics uh, but it was so delightful i'm so glad i read it really enjoyed it we'll definitely happily read anything else that tiff marcella writes right the next one is girl king by mimi Yu. this is my signed copy so i was able to meet uh mimi uh at um last year's um uh, ba mm-hmm. and uh, it was really really great um it's a story about uh you know it's, it's actually a tale of two sisters really uh, if you really want to think about it uh, Lou and Min have always sort of been sort of at odds. Lou is the uh, the girl king. That's what they're her nickname because she's the eldest. She was meant to inherit. Uh, she's a very strong fighter. 
uh, very, very like great swordsman, and um, she was expecting to inherit. Men on the other, uh, mm-hmm. men on the other hand, is like the younger forgotten sister that the the te- that their terrible mother just sort of like puts down all the time uh, until it was announced that she would not inherit and she would instead be married off to a cousin on her mom's side who would then become emperor. And that guy is a piece of work. So classic trope very well placed and very well used i'd like to say um and now it's up to and of course he's a terrible person and <laughs> like you're like of course he's a terrible yeah person. because there's got to be that kind of like a villainous kind of thing but when i read the synopsis and it was they said it was about two sisters sort of fighting for control of the kingdom which like how is this tiny mousy little younger sister who had just turned 14 and who had just recently became uh, become a woman is going to be an actual player in this game and lou sort of being dethroned now and forging her own path tries to figure it out so i I, for me the lore had good foundations but sort of got kind of clunky in the in the the exposition um it's a pretty simple story take my kingdom back right but it's so hard to root for either of them for me personally because you've got lou who's like rah rah let's do this i am strong i don't need no man kind of deal okay but i couldn't but i couldn't love her because you know my my my, uh, one of our good friends micah who is in like in film says you got to give him a save the cat moment you know you got to give him a moment where you can the audience can just go oh they did something super cool and now i like you i didn't like she did cool stuff but not enough for me to go oh i love you so much let's i want to see you win here it's like geez who's gonna win now it's almost like i get a game of thrones like it almost doesn't matter who wins um because that's just how it is and so it didn't land as well with me as i would like though it is intricately and beautifully uh uh, crafted, I'd like to think, lore-wise. Um, the plot is easy and simple enough to follow. Uh, you know, there's a ship in here that I'm like, all right, I can get behind this. Uh, and uh, without it being too, you know, YA romancy in a, in a in a way that makes me tune out. Um, but overall, I, I found myself wishing I could love it more, though I liked it. Like, I, I kind of want to know what happens next. But again, will I Google it or will I grab a copy? We'll see. My next book was sent to me by Scholastic last year, and I finally got around to reading it. It's Listen to Your Heart by Casey West. This is another young adult contemporary rom-com type situation. In this book, the main character is named Kate Bailey, and she basically lives for her life on the lake. Her family owns like the marina over there, and she aspires to inherit and run the same business. But uh, things sort of change for her in her junior year when her best friend Alana convinces her to join a podcasting class and then Kate ends up being chosen to be one of the hosts of their class's podcast for the year which is sort of like a anonymous, ask, anonymous asking for advice basically is what their podcast is about. And Kate discovers that maybe like there are possibilities out there that are worth exploring. There is also a romance in this one, which is not surprising because it's a Casey West book. And it was cute. This is actually one of the uh, one of the better Casey West rom-coms I've read. I've read quite a few of them. Some of them are really great and some of them are kind of like, mm, all right. This one was really cute. Um, I like the podcasting aspect. First of all, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts myself, but the idea of it in this one is so much fun. I like the whole lake aspect of it as well, that she has such passion for the lake and that she loves her small community and is perfectly content to be there. And I like that she eventually learns that maybe she should be open to more possibilities, whether or not her decision is still to stay at the lake or not. Um, I like the characters. I I like Kate. I like her best friend, Alana. I love her family, who all live like next door to each other. It's like her family and then her aunt on one side and her uncle on one side and their families, and it's great. I like their little small town community. Um, There were a lot of just really charming, cute things about this one. It would be a great Disney Channel original movie, which I have said (laughs) about many a Casey West book. Uh, So yeah, very enjoyable, very fun, very fluff. If you're looking for something that's perfect for like a quick spring summer read or something you want to take to the beach or to the lake, uh, lake. definitely check this one out. I, on the other hand, finally got around to reading Arusha on the End of Time by Roshni Chakshi. Yay! So, super fun. This was the first offering in the Rick Riordan Presents kind of imprint mm-hmm. where he takes a bunch of other authors and asks them to write mythology in their sort of native mm-hmm. uh, yeah. kind of like background. So, obviously, Arusha is, is based on um, the, the Pandava myths um, from, uh, I want to say, Tindu... Um, um, mythology i wasn't too crazy about it though i i like arusha as a character like she's funny and she's quippy and um she has she meets some great friends and there's a bunch of really good characters like it has all of the elements of a rick riordan verse multiverse kind of deal and he created that own genre like that, that sorry and he created that genre basically where you've got your myths you've got set in contemporary time and, and people who can 
uh, and characters who could sort of do that. What didn't work for me so much was that um, Aru, I felt, was more of a catalyst character. Like, mm -hmm. she was just really fun, really cool, quippy, and badass from, from start to finish. And it's everybody else around her that kind of changes. And so she was just like a badass the whole time. So I just thought, all right, I guess, girl, you got this. You don't need me to like root for you, but uh, <laughs> good job there. By the way, this was totally your fault. And that's the premise of Arusha. It's kind of a Pandora's box story where she opens up uh, like a like she release unleashes the sleeper onto the world and she has to stop him now because he's gonna like kill everything or whatever it is. I respect anybody who starts an adventure in their pajamas. I respect True. that so and much. And takes most of it in her pajamas. And takes so so in her pajamas. It was a little hard for me to follow the, the mythologies um, <laughs> because I wasn't too familiar with the Pandava um, the, the pieces. But um, for anybody who is looking for a nice fresh read, um, this is definitely a good alternative to uh, Karen Mala. Yeah. Uh, which was ironically also um, set in like an mm. like Indian which mythology. Which I haven't read yet. I actually like that better. So, um, but this is a good sort of alternative to try and explore and see if you want that kind of flavor there. Speaking of flavors, the next book I'm going to talk about has a strong food element to it. That is Natalie Tan's Book of Luck and Fortune by Rosalie Lim. This is a book I got from Berkeley, uh, and I buddy read it with Mel from Mel to the Any and Madeline from A Novel Inc. And the entire premise of this one is that the main character, Natalie, comes home when she finds out that her mother has died in order to arrange the funeral rites and it hurts her because she's been estranged from her mom over an argument that they had before she left all those years ago and once she returns she discovers that the apartment that she used to live in as well as the restaurant that is under it have now been passed on to her and mm -hmm. so it has always been her dream to run her own restaurant and she feels like this is a very like faded thing yeah but yeah. uh you know how the Chinese are about fortunes. Uh, well, she actually gets one from a neighbor that tells her that she has to cook three recipes for three of the neighbors to help them before, to ensure that her restaurant will be a successful venture. And so she does, and shenanigans ensue, and all of that good stuff that is in a romantic comedy. So much good food. Okay, the things I really liked about this book are the food aspect of it. There are a lot of recipes thrown in here. There is a lot of descriptions of cooking and food, and it all sounded amazing, and I kept craving things while I was <laughs> reading it. I also really like the cultural aspects of living in Chinatown and being of Chinese culture. I can't speak to it myself because obviously I'm not Chinese, I'm Filipino. Um, but it was fun to just see like how all of those things played a part in Natalie's story and the things that she chose to do or the things that people would say to her to do. I like that a lot. Here's the thing though. I actually think that this story would have translated better into a visual medium just because it would have been so entertaining to visually see this food being made oh, in front of your boy. face or to like see all of these effects that are and described And she would describe the, the food too and I'm and it, there and I'm it, like, it, I need to just, eat all of this. It, it, and it also has the sort of plot set up and like story build up that would make sense in a movie like that. So I think that would be an act. I think I would have actually enjoyed it even more in that medium. I enjoyed it already like this, but I can imagine enjoying it even more in that medium. I also wanted to mention before I forget that there is also a musical aspect to this and though I can't speak much to that I thought it was a really nice touch to the story and it felt very organic on the whole as well. It's also fun because there are tiny little uh, details of Filipino culture in this one because she's half Filipino I think. The, uh, ma the author is actually uh, Filipino Chinese. Uh, the main character is not at all Filipino but oh, she has traveled to the Philippines in the book and she cooks something that's from the Philippines and I love it and it makes me so happy. So yeah, on the whole, very enjoyable. Uh, I would still recommend checking it out if the premise sounds at all interesting to you. I still think it would make an even better movie though. Uh, I'd like to bring everybody's focus to James Nichols' uh, The Apprentice Witch. Uh, it is a story about Arian Wynn who in a world where uh, you know, like the government actually, you know, licenses witches because that's a thing. People who can manipulate like the forces of nature, blah, blah, blah. Her grandmother is actually on the Grand High Witch Council or whatever that is. Uh, she flunks, quote unquote, her, uh, quote unquote, flunks her kind of a, 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 a witch testing mm. day test, whatever, and does not make it to apprentice. But then, you know, her ma her grandma pulls a couple of strings and says, which she hates, by the way, because she wants to be a witch on her own merit, and says, you know what, give her a shot, right? Mm -hmm. The the machine probably fratzed out or whatever the heck that is. Yes, there is a machine that tests. And she gets assigned to like this tiny little village uh, at the border of nowhere by the weird kind of crazy black woods. And so it feels like Kiki's delivery service, but with a more kind of dark with a darker feel because it does have like i'm an apprentice switch some of my peers are snobs and Maybe i have a chance else, to... you know what else it also sort of reminds you little witch academia you remember this yeah yeah so there Something it's like that it's 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 got the whim
whimsy of both Kiki and Little Witch Academia, but it's got like a kind of a darker thing because there are darker things out there that you know only more seasoned witches mm. can actually deal with and take care of. So there's a, like a, that hint of charmed of you got to get some power and some juice, otherwise you know these terrible things happen. And so she has a different way of solving problems. Uh, it's a lot about you know winning the love and the trust of the township that mm. has not had a witch in a very long time. Mm -hmm. She has a regional supervisor that you know comes in. It's all very like mundane. But also very magical, which is totally I'm my, sorry, my. I can't think of Monday without thinking. Yes, we are Shadow Hunter Chat, but it's all very uh, ordinary. Uh, <laughs> but with with a hint of um, obviously all of the magical kind of realism and the actual magic, uh, and and it just feels like a young girl just trying to make her way in the world mm. uh, and get out of the shadow of her grandma, who is like a great witch, and they have a they, they also have a bookshop that they sort of live in and around, um, and when terrible things happen in the town that only she can stop she kind of steps to the play proves herself and realizes that it's actually like she's actually better than she thought she was and to me that's just no. great and that that's why great. i love this i should have saved this for last but um that's okay you still like the next book but i still too. like the next book a lot as well so highly recommend the apprentice witch and i will read the rest of the so it's one of three i am going to get the <laughs> book two and three very soon so remember how maggie talked about uh Batman earlier. Well, uh -huh. this is semi-related to that because I finally read another DC Icons book and that is Catwoman Soul Stealer by Sarah J. Mess. This one is centered around Selena Kyle who two years prior to like where she is in the present day in the book, she actually disappeared from Gotham City and now she's back and she has this plan that she has an ulterior, uh, she has a plan that she needs to enact in order to achieve her ultimate goal, which I'm not going to tell you what it is because you'll find that out at some point in this book. So she knows what pieces she needs to move around and how to play things, but she doesn't quite count on Batwing uh, interrupting these plans. Yeah, Batwing, or by Luke the way. Or Luke Fox interrupting these plans. Luke Fox. I enjoyed this one a lot. It has a lot of, if you've read Sarah J Mass before, you will recognize a lot of the things that she does in her writing in it. And that's not a bad thing at all. I find that quite enjoyable. So I definitely enjoyed that. I like seeing how she took some familiar faces and concepts from the bat world. I'm just gonna call it the bat universe, bat world, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, and world. incorporated them into this story. Like I thought that was extremely interesting. It's a little bit older, I guess, cause Selena's a little bit older in this one. Um, Selena still did give me kind of Selena vibes, so that was kind of funny. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very well put together. The plot actually works itself out really well by the ending of it. And I like that there is actually also a very strong like sort of friendship aspect. There's like a romance in this too, obviously, because it's Sarah. But there's also like a very strong friendship aspect to it and a strong family aspect. Overall, it was definitely a fun read. I think by a very slim margin, uh, Batman Nightwalker is still my favorite of the DC icon <laughs> so far. It was very enjoyable, very fun. Definitely glad I finally read it. Alrighty, and now for my favorite book that I've read so far. And yes, I'm one book away from completing the TBR <sighs> book. That, and she's just super competitive, but really she reads more than me. Um, this is Storm Runner by J.C. Cervantes. It was super slow for me at the start and I couldn't get into it. But when I finally just sort of knuckled through, like, sort of like, like, uh, like the start. I don't know if this was clunky or I was clunky. I have a feeling I was clunky. Um, again, sorry about Zeno Bispo, who has one leg shorter than the other. Uh... And you'd think that that was fine, right? Unlike with Arusha, where um, she's almost kind of like, I mean, sure, she lies, but that was it. Like, that was her, her kind of character quirk, and she didn't really, like, have to overcome, uh, to my knowledge or to my remembrance, to have to overcome anything and change something dramatically about herself. It was not a journey to, like, courage. It was a journey to care, right? Um Zane, on the other hand, you know, he's got a limp. He's got a cane. He mm. is starting a new in a new school, and things go kind of crazy when monsters start coming out of the volcano in the backyard and he discovers that he has uh, a part to play in this terrible terrible prophecy of doom that might result in <laughs> ah, the destruction of the of world doom. and that's great right and and i love what i love the most i think about about uh, storm runner is not just that it, it's a it's a story like you know like about like heroes and stuff but that they were able to take his bum leg and weave it into the mythology the oh, same yeah, way yeah. that Rick Riordan was able to take dyslexia and say that anybody with dyslexia is actually a demigod mm. because they can't read normal letters. They because can only read ancient read Greek. Greek. Yep. And to me, that touched my heart so much because for any kid who's got something strange about them, uh, is read and say that in another world you can imagine that it's something totally different. It's something that shouldn't hinder you. It's something that can actually empower you. And that's exactly what happens with Zane's leg here. That's the end of the spoilers. Um, how they tie it into the lore is perhaps my favorite thing. Plus, plus, 
I don't know any of the Mayan gods here. Alexa has talked I, about I the goddess. Don't. Alexa has talked about the goddess Ishkakao, who is she's the, the only of one that I actually know. And I'm just like I'm converting to that tr right? <laughs> way of life. I mean, uh, it's the goddess of chocolate. It's the goddess of chocolate. Yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. A lot of it isn't familiar. That's probably why it felt clunky to me because I just couldn't connect to it the same way you would connect to, like, let's say, um, Gorgons, who are you know Walmart enthusiasts. Right, I I'm that sorry. that was really funny too. That makes complete sense to me, um, or you know, like or oracles who you know, like what regular was the, kids. What was the one in our show where there's like a beauty parlor? Do you remember? Yeah, that? and that was tied to with this other kind of demon that wanted to steal like beauty and stuff like that, which and totally you, makes yeah, sense. Beauty, yes, that's yeah. it, so, that so that's great. So I love how the Riordan uh, multiverse books kind of do that, mm. but specifically with Stormrunner, it ends very, very satisfyingly to me personally. A uh, little weird how it ended, but I'll take it. It's great. Um, and, and again, yeah, to take a weakness and fold it into the mythology and, and create a strength around it and say this shouldn't hinder you but it is actually something that makes you special he doesn't mm. lose the limp uh which you would think expect but it, but it actually becomes part of him because it it's part of something more beautiful the same way the dyslexia makes, yeah. you, makes you a demigod here uh there's a reason why his 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 leg is the bum leg and i think that's super super cool yeah so yeah so highly recommend so glad we have book two in the house already even if it's coming out in september so very very grateful for that. The last book that I'm going to talk about is actually one of the books I have loved the most this year. It was something that I was very nervous going into because I have been reading a lot of YA fantasy and not all of it has been that great this <laughs> year. But I will say that Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson is definitely one of the newer YA fantasy releases that I absolutely loved. And this one is out in June, I think around June 14th or 12th or something like that. Anyway, the important thing that you need to know about this one is if you like fantasy that will sort of give you like throwback vibe feels of like older classic YA fantasy, you will probably enjoy this book. If you like books about magical libraries and sorcerers, hey, hey. you will also like this book. Essentially, the entire plot centers around Elizabeth, who has been brought up in one of the great libraries of Ostermere ever since she was a baby left on their doorstep. Yeah. And so she has always aspired to be a warden of the library, which means that she gets to work with the grim wars that are stored in the libraries, whether it's to protect them or to protect other people from them. And to rhyme them with armor. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, that's that's the last armor joke. Uh, but one night, a terrible crime is committed in the library that she lives in, and she is implicated in it. And so she is taken to the capital city by a sorcerer named Nathaniel Thorne. And there, she uncovers a bigger conspiracy brewing, one that has been in place for a very long time. And so she and Nathaniel and Nathaniel's demonic companion, uh, Silas, have to work together in order to figure out a way to stop terrible things from happening, aka pretty much world-ending things. Mm. And this one was such a pleasant surprise. Like, I had a feeling I was gonna like it a lot. I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. And a big part of that is due to the fact that Rogerson successfully managed, manages to create a world that I absolutely loved. She gave us magic, but in a way that was like easy to digest, made sense for this world, is very like self-contained. That's the best word for it. Um, I like the idea of books being magical, which is a lot of like it's books and demons in this book basically and it's just so fascinating like the way she incorporated it into the story and for me like I just I laughed it all up basically and I also really liked the characters in the story I loved Elizabeth who just loves books like she genuinely loves books and it like shines throughout the entire story she's also just one of those people who like when she knows the right thing to do she's like we have to do it like it doesn't matter how risky it is it doesn't matter how much we have to fight we have to do it and i really appreciated that i also really enjoyed silas he's the demonic companion in the story <laughs> he is actually like the perfect gentleman even though he's a demonic companion like he runs the household he takes care of both elizabeth and nathaniel I dig that. he's also a demon so he's kind of powerful obviously <laughs> but um yeah he was like he's like he's always telling nathaniel to like tie his cravat correctly or like serving tea and stuff like that which was delightful and then we also have nathaniel who <laughs> he's a sorcerer kind of got a little angst going on there he's also a bit sassy like he has a lot of commentary that reminds you of nikolai a little bit because he's just like vain and like he actually he's like a combination of will herondale and nikolai basically. <laughs> oh dear and it, and it was thoroughly enjoyable i like i just i really found it fun and the story also plays out 
in a very like organic logical way and even though i didn't have any idea how it would end like that ending just feels like the perfect way for it to end and it was so enjoyable this is a standalone which is even more impressive because it's such a good story uh looking forward to reading whatever margaret rogerson has coming up next i know she has an enchantment of ravens but i was warned off that one by a few people just because they felt like it was not quite what they had wanted it to be and so i just read this one first instead and i'm so glad i did because i loved it so much and i would highly recommend checking it out when it's out in june cool. all right that's enough of me babbling <laughs> of us uh, babbling yeah this is the end of this particular what we read video we would love to know in the comments if you've read anything that we featured in the video Holler if you away. want to read any of those things or what you've been currently reading because we would love happy to, to take know. some questions yeah and, and answers. our next video will be up next friday and we will see you guys then bye